So seizure, seizure management. I, if you're a nurse, I'm sure you had a patient that that had a seizure and we all have our little stories and funny ways of how we went around things and we grow and we get experience, we get better. So when it comes to seizures, we could break it down between two categories, right? There's an epileptic seizure and a non-epileptic seizure. So with the epileptic seizure is it's sudden, it's a seizure that has uncontrolled electrical disturbances. Just imagine a computer that's just being fried with electro signals and you just need a you just need a reboot. So it causes disturbances in the brain and it could affect things like behavior, movement, feelings, and then levels of consciousness, of course, where you're not even remembering the event. So that usually happens. Epileptic seizures, correct? That could happen. Um, it's more internal. Something could, um, like a brain injury. Or actually, I'm blanking out here. So for seizures, yeah, there's no really, we don't really understand fully what, what can cause a seizure disorder. Uh, but sometimes it could be like trauma to the head. If somebody falls, hits their head, they could develop seizures. It could, it could be genetic. It could be due, due to medication imbalances or electrolyte imbalances. So there's no really a one root, root cause for seizures. It's so something that happens that throws off your brain and then, then you get a seizure. But like Matt was saying, there's also the non epileptic seizures where there's really no electrical changes in your brain. Your brain looks fine, but you're still exhibiting these seizure symptoms or seizure signs. And an example of the non-epileptic seizures, for example, like pseudo seizures, right? So one time when I was in clinicals, there was a patient and she came in for a seizure, of course, but her background story is when she was seven years old, she fell off a horse and hit her head. And then ever since then, she had seizures. So like they do MRIs, they do all these brain tests to diagnose her and everything looks good. She's just still experiencing the seizures. And it's crazy how that one event somehow messed up the electrical system of our brain. Like, how does that happen? It shows like how like fragile we are, we are as humans, how like sensitive the brain is to like these, these like things you would think are small changes, like you hitting your head. Okay. It might not be the biggest deal, but then look at the internal damage it causes. Yeah. And then, and then also the non-epileptic seizures could be things like, I know somebody that like was taking too much cocaine and got a seizure and then bam, like he can't do drugs or he can't go to nightclubs and do things because all that stimulation is just like, it. basically what happens for the people that don't know is you have like a threshold, like imagine like um, milli, millimoles of like voltage, right? And once you pass that threshold of what your brain can handle, it just goes into overload. It's like overclocking a CPU uh, computer for those that are like trying to wrap this around. Yeah, so, so you said that he had um, an epileptic one or non-epileptic? It's an example of non-epileptic, okay. meaning... Um, he was using a substance or just like a head injury that caused this reaction to happen. Okay. But was it actually changes in his brain? I mean, you, you guys would have known, right? I wouldn't know. I didn't ask okay. those questions. Right, for sure. Well, let's get into the seizures guys. There's, there's like so much different, different, different classification of seizures. There's like a handful of them. So we're going to try and, you know, hit them all on the head if, if we can. We're going to talk about a little bit about each of them, but for the epileptic seizures, the main I guess two categories of them is your partial and then your generalized. The, the partial usually starts in one part of the brain, affects that part, or it can move on to another one. And then your general, generalized seizures, they're the ones that affect the, the whole brain. Those are kind of the ones that you kind of, I'm sure you've possibly seen. And those are the big, big drastic ones, I guess. So uh, one partial seizure could be a focal onset or a seizure where someone kind of has a blank stare on their face. They might be doing some weird like tongue movements or like lip smacking and they're like, they're like frozen. They, they know what's going on, but they just can't do anything about it. And then they usually snap back, back out of it. And those, those are like daydreams, right? Like we say he's daydreaming and they do different. You do, it's funny how like there's different things like with the tongue, they'll do some weird things. I had a patient that was intubated and what she was doing was she was just staring up into the sky, like, eyes open, not blinking. She's not responding to me. And I'm just like, whoa, she's having a seizure. And I don't know if she had a seizure because she ended up going like into SVT and we ended up shocking her. And then after we shocked her twice, she like snapped into it. She could have had a seizure, but it was, it's just strange how that they happen. Mm. It's very, it's very interesting. It's crazy how like your, your brain works. Uh, I guess the next one we have for you guys is the focal onset impaired awareness seizure. So it's basically like the one that I said before, except this time the person has a blank stare on their face, but they don't, they don't know that they do. So the prior one was where you're just frozen and aware. This one, they're kind of frozen and they're not aware. So it could still exhibit the same symptoms, but the main difference is that they're not aware at this point. 
And what um what really kind of sparked me here is they they're able to walk. They they could walk aimlessly. So you could have a seizure even and be unconscious, but you're still doing an activity. Like it's it's um it's fascinating. Mm. But let's go to the next one. So we have a focal bilateral tonic clonic seizure. So this one is going to involve a little bit more where you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to see symptoms throughout your body. And it involves starting at one point of the brain and then heading over to the other one. So seizures, they could actually like um, switch over when it comes to uh, brain activity. So they could start at one side, travel to the other side, or when we start talking about the full on seizures, that, they, that brain activity is happening on both sides. We also have an absence seizure which means that it happens on both sides of the brain at the same time. Those is when you're able to have like a period of like unconsciousness blanks there, of course, and the, the person after the seizure has no recollection of what's ex, um, exactly is happening. We have repetitive movements as well. So it could be chewing. It could be rhythmic blinking, like just doing that, tugging on the clothes. And they're more common in uh, children. And this one I actually have never seen before. Have you? I think, uh, I'm not sure. Well, I had the one time I had a lady seize at the gym and we're kind of helping her out, but I'm not sure what kind of seizure she, that would have been. It was either like a, like an absence. Well, no, that was definitely not good. She lost consciousness. Um, she had like the lift neck and everything. So it might've been an absence seizure. The thing is she fell down, but she didn't have any kind of, kind of jerking motions or anything like that. So she might've had like a, a tonic seizure. Okay. That's what she wanted to have. So we just kind of put her on her side and kind of just called the paramedics. We got an AED just in case we needed it, but she never lost a pulse. Um, just, she just had like, she was foaming out her mouth and she was like moving her tongue weirdly. So I was scared she was going to swallow her tongue or bite it, but, but she ended up not doing it. And then the paramedics came in and they kind of took over. It's kind of funny. Like that used to be a myth that you have to put something in a person's mouth. And that's one thing that you guys should not do. If someone is having a seizure, just turn them to the side and don't put anything in their mouth. They used to put like tongue blades. They used to put like, you know, the bite blocks and turn them on the side. Like it's okay if they bite the tongue, just there's more risk than benefit when you're putting something in their mouth while they're actively seizing. Yeah. The issue would be if she actually swallowed her tongue and wasn't able to, able to breathe. Then at that point I would probably take, probably not my finger, but I would take some kind of, some, some kind of a piece of straw or something and try to get that tongue out because that's, you know, she obviously would, would not be able to breathe. You said well, yeah. straw. So would you like, I'm trying well, to demonstrate this. Well, I'm trying to talk there, put some negative pressure and then try to suck it out. I have no idea. I want to, it's a gym. So I'm sure they had, I'm sure they had to have like a tongue blade or something or somewhere. Right. I'm sure they have a first aid kit. Or maybe you could do like the Heimlich maneuver when somebody's choking and try to take the tongue out of the mouth just so it like shoots out but, at somebody. She's, she was having a seizure though. So I'm not about to try to Heimlich at somebody's having a seizure. You got to let them have the seizure. You get the tongue out of there. I'm, I'm just talking shit. But, um, shit. That that be I have never heard that somebody just bit off their tongue, went in the back, and their airway is compromised. I'm sure that has happened. We could probably look that up and then find out if that actually happened. And that's yeah, what's so, Someone's got to someone's got to have an Uncle Leo died of of swallowing the tongue during a seizure, for sure. Yeah, we'll look up Uncle Leo on Patreon later on for the yeah. after hours. <laughs> All right, guys. So back to the seizures. The next seizure we have for you is a tonic clonic seizure, and that's your typical. A uh, seizure that you would see in a movie or or to see the hospital or somewhere where it's it's the convulsion, it's like the jerking back and forth and just the random movements. Uh, but it's tonic clonic seizure, so there's two parts to it. The tonic part is when the patient kind of um, loses loses um, the sense of reality. You could say they kind of they lose consciousness, and but their body drops. They 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 stiffen up, and which you know causes them to fall on the ground, and that's when the the clonic phase comes in where with the actual jerking of the arms or, or the legs. So that's a, this is like your full blown seizure. I think it was called a grand mal before with a complete convulsion, but first they completely lose a sense of reality and they con contract, contract, and then just drop their weight and then they convulse. And the, usually with these seizures, you're the one you're going to see sometimes a loss of voluntary control. So they might, you know, piss themselves. They might poop in their pants. I don't want to say, you know, the S word here. So a lot of things that can happen. And usually these patients are going to have a really rough post ictal state, meaning so when after a seizure, they're going to, they're going to be completely out of it. it. It's as if they like woke up and they're like, where the F am I? They have like this blank stare. They're looking around. They could still be nonverbal. For example, it happens and usually takes a little bit of time for them to um, recoup. 
yeah, the, the post ectophase, I actually had a patient experience a seizure and I went into a post ectophase, but yeah, but they're, they're so tired. Like your, your muscles are contracting, relaxing so much and so often where they literally get tired, your glucose can literally drop to, to a really low number. So you could, you know, after you come out of seizure, you could be hyp- hypoglycemic. So that's also important to take into, into consideration because I have two seizure patients that had seizures on me and then after the seizure was done, they were comp- so tired. They were hungry. They were tired. They were still kind of, I didn't feed them because they were still kind of loopy, but they were completely exhausted or they went to sleep like within the next hour because they were so tired. Wow. You didn't feed them at how unethical. <laughs> well, they're still kind of not with it. and I didn't trust them to eat. So I just said, Hey, we, I mean, I'm not gonna give you food right now because like you're, you're still post though and you're still kind of drowsy. You're like slurring on your words and I don't trust you with swallowing. I'm sorry, John, but I think the kitchen, the cafeteria is closed tonight. So we, there's, there's no applesauce or graham crackers. I'm sorry, man. You just have to wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but they took their sugar. So their sugar was fine both times, but it could definitely drop. Did you ever have a patient fake a seizure, man? Because sometimes that's hard to tell whether they're actually having a seizure or not. Because a lot of patients are wanting Ativan, right? They're depending on these drugs. I had this guy just shaking and like doing something. And we're trying to figure out whether he's actually having a seizure. Like there's a bunch of nurses in the room. We're just like, um, should we give some Ativan? Should we call the physician? We're just like, what the heck, man? Interesting. I've never had that happen. But yeah, there's some people that are like hardcore drug seekers that will literally do anything they can just to get their hands on that drug. But that's insane. So did you guys give him Ativan? So like he, he continuously had seizures like every 30 minutes. I was like, what the heck, man? So the first time I gave him the two milligrams and the other time I think we just didn't do anything and we kind of, he stopped and he's just like, woke up. He's like, oh, what's going on? You know, like he's just like narrating this whole thing. We're just like, all right, dude, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Like you just don't hear this stuff. Like, man, like someone faking a seizure, man, but it, it happens. So did he, was he, was he like aware of when that was happening? He was bullshitting brother. That's, that's the problem. He just, he was just drug seeking, man. And we figured out after a little bit and then he wanted to leave AMA. It was this whole thing, man. I had to call security back in um, my old job. Well, that's some shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have, I've never had that happen to me before. Yeah. All right, guys. Next seizure, a tonic seizure. Um, a tonic means tone. So like muscle tone. So with these seizures usually affects like one part of your body. So, but it can be different, different body part each time. So for example, you're carrying a glass of water and then your arm seizes up. And you don't know why and you didn't do it on purpose and you drop the glass. So that's like a, a tonic, tonic seizure. Then we're going to go into the clonic seizures, which I was a little bit confused because it's just the stiffening of the muscles, right? So they're just, um, they're preventing from getting um, relaxed. So you might um, be experiencing just stiffening, jerking, things like that. Most common, which occurs in babies. And I'm not very good in peds and anything like that. So I can't very, I can't really vouch for the seizure and talk much about it. Yeah, me either, man. I've only time I had peds was on at a clinical and it was, it was, it was pretty fun. So since you mentioned a clonic seizure, also the, the tonic seizure where you have mm-hmm. random relaxation and contractions, but similar to the clonic one, it affects only one body part. So like you might have like a jerking in your arm compared to the one we mentioned before where you kind of just like your muscle spasms or you just let go of certain things. So this is different because this is when your actual muscles actually relax and contract. So it's like one arm spasms, like your leg would do the same thing. And I feel like that I have that sometimes. Well, that's a Charlie horse, man. It's a calf. Anyways, so there's also something called the myoclonic, myoclonic seizure. And I feel like I have experienced that before. So have you ever had this like phase where, and it usually lasts two to three seconds where you're like falling asleep, falling asleep. And you just have this like shake, like your whole body just like jumps out of itself. And you just like wake up. You're like, geez, what the hell just happened? And those are myoclonic and those are actually considered seizures, but they're not really harmful seizures. Like, like, I guess you could say it. Yeah. I feel like that always happens to me. Like when you're, it happens to me usually when I'm really tired and like, I'm really tired. I'm trying to stay awake and I just give up. and just like, I'm just going to go to bed. And I like, you have this like little jerking, like you wake up, you're just like, like distraught, like where am I? Or like your arm jerks or your, or your, or your leg jerks. My legs sometimes jerks. Actually, my leg probably jerks the most out of, out of everything when I'm really tired. So like for me, I usually have it when I'm like, when I had a stressful day and I'm like super exhausted and I'm in the phase of falling asleep, I'll get it. So usually it happens then. Um, 
I used to have it a lot of nursing school, to be honest, now that I'm looking back at things like I was just stressed out way too often, came home trying to fall asleep. And I just had these like little jerks. Well, let's go. It's completely normal guys. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You just, just tell people you had a seizure, you know? <laughs> so let's go, let's go into like the last one here. Well, there's a few more, but there's something called a gelastic seizure and it starts in the hypothalamus. What can we do to tell you about the seizure? It's basically people that are uncontrollably laughing or giggling. And this person sometimes may look like they're smiling or smirking. Never, never really experienced it, but it's, um, it could be both focal or partial. It could be the person crying nonstop. So it could be, it's funny how the person could be having an emotion that's like happy, meaning they're laughing, but internally what's going on is they could have a lot of anxiety and they could be very fearful because they have absolutely no idea what's going on. It's really scary. Or they're laughing inappropriately at a social event and they can't control it. They just keep continuing to laugh. Like that, that's, a, that's a crazy seizure to have because you're conscious of it, you're aware. And that kind of messes with your psyche where you might then have like, you know, social anxiety. You don't, you don't want to go out to settings because you're afraid that the seizure might take control. Right. Like imagine if you're like a 12 year old kid and you're at someone's funeral and you, you, you burst out laughing and you can't control it. And then, you know, you, you leave, you're just like, holy shit, that was scary. And then you go back in and the same thing happens. Like that's, tra- that's traumatizing to people. And that'd be a scary thing to go through as a kid, especially when you're, it's when you're, when, when you're developing, imagine if they're like you're a teenager and you do these random, random acts on certain occasions. And like, I'm sure people are like bullied people like that. And, and that kind of sucks. It's just, man, seizures suck. I, I would not wish seizures are my worst enemy. And imagine like you can't like drive the car sometimes you have no ability to do that. You, yeah, you lose a lot of quality of life. I, I do feel bad for people that have them. And same thing in the hospital setting, man, like just seeing it happen sometimes it's just so sad because the person, I mean, they look like they're having an exorcism and what else can I tell you? The full tonic grandma seizure. It looks crazy. Um, and then might as well just give some nerf- nursing tips right now. So if your patient is having a damn seizure, even prior to that, make sure your rails are padded, right? Always turn them on the side. And if you have your, like your little watch, I would check the time. I think that's very important. So you could explain to the physician, you could explain to the family. And if you're writing your nursing note at the end of the shift, you could explain how long the seizure actually lasted. Yeah, and if you're outside of the hospital, like kind of keep kind of taking a consideration of the same concept. So you want to you know, put them on the ground, make sure they, they have a safe space around them, make sure they're not going to knock anything down or hurt themselves like by a wall. Because if they're convulsing, you know, you never know where their arm's going to go. And, you know, put them on their side. Get an 80 just in case because sometimes people do code afterwards or if it's like a really long seizure, you know, people lose oxygen to their brain and, you know, they could lose their pulse and just make sure you're prepared each time. And also just, if they're vomiting, that's that's something that does happen. You want to, that's why you're for sure should keep them on their side and just call that one and get the paramedics. Also, some, what some people do when you're talking about oxygen is they put a full non-rebreather. So they put the mask, oxygen mask on 15 liters and they just put it right next to their face just so they're getting extra oxygen. I see some people do that and don't leave the room. I think I've done that before. I'm just like, my patient's having a seizure. I'm just, yo guys, I need some freaking help in here. And I'm just like leaving the patient, like stay in the freaking room with the damn patient. I think I also had an event where I like freaked out and no one was getting the Ativan. And I think I left the room and just left my patient. No, the nurse was in there, but technically I should be the one that's in the room with my patient because I know him or her best. And I should be telling the other nurse to, you know, grab me some drugs. Exactly. Yeah. If you're ever in a major situation, it's always there with the patient because you know the patient best. You know how they were at their baseline. You know what changed and you know their history. So yeah, never leave your patient. So I guess we'll touch on the last seizure while we're still here. You know, it'll be the febrile ones. And those are mostly common in kids aged from three months to three or five years. And that's kind of a sign that the kid is sick. Sometimes, you know, they have a fever. You're not sure if you should go to a doctor with them, with them or not. Um, and the kid has a seizure. That's, that's something that is potentially life-threatening. That's why it is important to just, if you're not sure if you should go to a doctor, just go to a doctor. These, these little kids are very frail and very, you know, you, every little thing could potentially harm them. And a fever is definitely not a thing you want to mess with. You know, it's funny. My mom actually took my little brother to the ER while I've been out in Cali. He had very, very bad stomach pain and my mom just took him. And what happened is he basically passed some gas in the ER and he felt better. So, 
<laughs> Isn't that funny? No. And that and that was it. But um, she did she want to stay home from school? Did he go to school? I, I don't know the situation, man. I got to talk to my little brother, freaking funny guy. But I, I do have sympathy for my mom because I've had appendix before and my ruptured. So therefore she's like, man, if you're having stomach pain, it must be the appendix, you know? So she already had that internal thing from her previous experience that made her kind of go to the ER. Yeah, I probably think the stomach, stomach pains so much. When I, when I was younger, um, my parents thought I had like a stomach issue. Like literally, literally like they thought like they're getting kind of worried. But, you know, then I kind of switched to, then I kind of threw different, different things that I would, you know, have a, have a headache or you know, I'll put the hot towel on, on my head and my, my parents would check my temperature and be high, like, damn, you are, you know, and then they take your temperature and it's elevated because you're, you're you know, you're warm, you had a towel on, over your head and you had the covers on just to get out of school because you want to, you know, play soccer with your boys. Everyone's doing it today. So I got to do it too, you know, and, and then, it, does, you know, it worked. It does happen. One time I got so drunk and I threw up. This was in high school and you shouldn't be drinking unless you're 21, but it is what it is. And I told my mom that, you know, I ate a piece of ham, stomach was hurting, you know, threw up, couldn't go to school. And then my dad calls me on the side. He's like, Matt, tell me what you did last night. And I'm like, dad, you know, I got drunk. <laughs> it's like, don't worry, I will tell mom. <laughs> that, yeah, that was that, that's business. Too. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, on a Patreon episode after hours. For sure. So let's go into diagnosis, guys. So we, we know what a seizure is. We know the different types. We kind of know what to do during a seizure, but how, we, how do we diagnose them? So we have something called an EEG, and it's a device that checks basically brain electrical patterns, and it checks whether they're abnormal. They use this even sometimes for intubated patients to see if they're even their brain is functioning after a stroke. Um, these EEGs are annoying in the hospital because I can never find or read about them. They're usually some randomly in some kind of note. Um, but I, I don't, I, I don't know much. I don't know much about them to be honest, man. That's, that's what I'm going to tell you because they're like, they're not very effective. I feel like a lot of pay, a lot of doctors, personal opinion, they're going to take them down for a CT scan. Oh yeah. Well at, at that point, yeah. In our, you know, in our, um, I guess ICU is, and it's because we're in the Midwest or I've been in the Midwest and you were in the Midwest. A lot of our issues predominantly are like strokes and like cardiac issues. So, so you won't, so the thing is they're more likely to get a stroke than somebody that's, that has an active, actively new seizure diagnosis because there's more people that are having strokes and brain bleeds and, and clots in their brain. There's a lot more of them than people with actual seizures. So EEGs and I mean, EEGs, like if you're sedated for such a long time, your EEG is going to be probably like inconclusive for a while. It's because you got to filter all, all that, all that um, sedation, especially if you're on dialysis. If you're on di- dialysis, you mean like propofol or like no, if no, you're I'm, intubated? So I'm saying, so I'm saying EEGs aren't always like the best option because if someone's been sedated for a long time and, you know, they have a poor creatine function, their liver, their kidneys aren't working, you know, to their full capability, the EEG is going to be, it's going to show that you don't have activity in certain areas, but you actually might, you're just still sedated because the sedation isn't out of your body yet. Yeah. Some, okay. some people have, some people are, are completely sedated like two or three days after you, know, you stop sedation it's just because it takes that long for their body to process it. No, I agree with that one. So it does take longer. And that's why with, when it comes to the EG and we could do a full episode about it and how it checks brain activity, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a first line of treatment, but it's definitely on the list to do, to, to do things also yeah, but I mean, if someone's like having a, having a seizure you know the only way to check if it's actually an epileptic seizure or, or like the non-epileptic ones would be to hook up with eeg so I, the point of that is when you're having a seizure the eeg is going to show you what's going on during that seizure yeah i just don't know how fast they could be like you need a tech that that does and set us has sets up this machine then you have a bunch of leads that you put on all over the brain like it takes long to set up i've seen one set up before so i don't know how effective it would be I'm kind of talking shit about this EEG. Okay, I'm going to let it go. It's if a anybody, device yeah, that anybody, checks for brain activity. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody there is a seizure expert or knows a lot about neuro, it would be cool to let us know. Maybe you hop on here, explain seizures more in depth. Or if we completely, if we completely butchered it, you know, let, let us know. We'll have you on here explain it better. We didn't butcher it. We just um, aren't brushed up in the EEG category here. So let's talk about some drugs when it comes to... Um, when it comes to seizures. So the first line, as you know, it's usually the benzos and Valium, lorazepam, 
the benzos, like the clonopam. So when it comes to having a straight up seizure in the hospital, you always want an IV, right? And we're going to push some Ativan. It slows down the brain activity. It's also used for anti-anxiety. And on the pot, um, on the IG story, I said it was my favorite medication. Oh, it is your favorite medication. Why do you like it so much? Well, it's, it's definitely not for stopping seizures, let me tell you that. So, and <laughs> there's a lot of patients that have anxiety in the hospital. For alcoholic patients that are going crazy, Ativan usually works very well. So... It's a drug that I, that I that I use a lot, and it's funny because someone mentioned uh, it's your favorite medication isn't the um, the milk of God. You know, what milk of God is right propofol. Propofol, yeah. So that's a medication that we use we use on intubated patients to like knock them out, basically. But um, I don't use that enough to like it as much as Ativan. Yeah, I, I have, have a drug of choice. Ativan saved me um, a hassle multiple times in my nursing career, and it's it, it's clutch. But you know. You shouldn't use it just because you have the means to use it. You know, there's, you should definitely take preliminary options first. So don't just, just because the patient's pissing you off, doesn't mean you should, hey, you know, doc, you know, he's got severe anxiety. Let me get some Ativan just in case. Just, just, just for PRN, you know, that one milligram or two milligram, just, just PRN just in case he needs it. But it doesn't really need it. He's just pissing you off. So you do it anyways. You know, that's not the proper approach to it. You want to, you know, talk, talk to them, see why they're acting like this. Maybe they're just, overhead tables in the wrong place and you can just fix it real, real quick. So just see why they act like this. And then, you know, if they get crazier and crazier and you, you know, you feel like you're harmed and you feel like this animal might help them, then go ahead and go ahead and give it, but don't give out a candy. Don't give it out like candy. Peter said it very well. And of course I do all those measures, Peter. Uh -huh. I'm joking. <laughs> but sometimes to be honest, when patients have anxiety, I like to talk to them and ask them like where it's stemming from. And I like to talk about it. Sometimes like people, are, people aren't even aware why they're anxious. I'm like, why are you anxious? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, well let's, let's talk about it. Like what's going on what caused it? Is it a, is it an event? Is it a setting? Is it a situation? Is it somebody, somebody at home? So it's funny how sometimes if you're able to pinpoint your anxiety, the patient's able to calm down and we could de-escalate the situation before we got to give them some candy. That's what I'm saying, man. That's a great approach, man. It's a great approach to your patients. If I'm ever a patient, I hope you're my nurse, you know, and I hope you have the Ativan ready for me. <laughs> like candy, right? <laughs> hey, oh, this is an awesome nurse. Always pick him, man. He always gives out the best <laughs> medication. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine you saw that on a Google review. You saw, you saw a recommend nurse met. He's got all the good drugs. Imagine <laughs> that'd be, that'd that's a Google review at your hospital. That'd be funny. I mean, there, there is a review from my previous hospital. Oh, that, that cute nurse, Matt, what a Polish stallion. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Funniest thing ever. <laughs> but some, sometimes, I mean, speaking of candy, giving out candy, sometimes there's, there's patients that know what they want. And it's like, I had a patient that was nauseous and guess what, guess what worked for her nausea? It wasn't Zofran. What was it? Morphine? No, it was freaking um, Benadryl. So I had to, I had to give Benadryl IV to stop her nausea. I mean, I can't refute, this is the patient is telling me this, right? Pain is subjective and everything else. So I gave some, I gave some Benadryl for the nausea. I guess it went away and knocked her out too. Yeah. Let me guess. She wanted, she wanted uh, both medications at the same time. She wanted the Benadryl and the morphine at the same time. And then the, the anti-nausea medication afterwards. She wasn't one of those, but there's, <laughs> there's patients and I don't know the listeners, not everybody is a, you know, nurse, but there's those patients that like things their specific way. And they like something gets pushed. Sometimes they'll watch you pushing the medication to like, you know, they know how it goes. Like imagine if a patient tells you, you know, you could push it a little faster. And it's like, <laughs> you look at them and you're just like, wow, man. Nope. I'm actually not because, you know, according to nursing standards, like I pushed over three minutes. Sometimes I do ask like the patient, I'm like, so how are you feeling? And they explain to me, like, if I'm pushing dilated, I always get curious to like, how's that patient feeling? Cause technically it's like getting a dose of heroin, man. But they always say they get like this warm feeling in their head first. I'm going to ask somebody the next time. I've asked somebody a few times. I just forgot what the, re what the response is. I'm going to ask the next time I'm giving the lottery or some morphine. I mean, you know, they're feeling good regardless, man. Pain goes away. They're feeling crispy. Heart rate drops down a little bit. Blood pressure maybe is going to be a little bit on the lower side, but it's all good. Now they're chilling. Now they're sleeping good. They got what they wanted. All right, guys. So 
you know, there's medications that treat these seizures and I give Kepra a lot on the unit for seizures if, if they're, you know, in-house. But there's also other options because sometimes drugs don't fully work. There's also marijuana that they use to treat seizures. But the, I guess the next option would be seizure or not, not seizure, but next option for surgery would be like a removal or an ablation of a certain part of your brain. So they could figure out through the EEG or through different measures of where the seizure activity is occurring in and they could kind of burn that piece or maybe even cut it out or whatever they, they think it's right. I mean, people have got low back before and, and stuff, so you never know. They also have like neuromodulation. So they have devices that stimulate the, the vagus nerve and they're able to control the seizure like that through a device. And it changes the way how your brain cells work by giving electrical stimulation in specific areas where the seizure is happening. Very, very fascinating. I wish we could get a neuroscientist on that talks about that. But it works the same way like these pain devices. So sometimes people that have chronic pain, they get these little um, neuro... What, is it in their spine somewhere? It's it's basically implanted in their back and it stimulates the nerves to help relieve pain. So same thing here where it's stimulating the specific areas of the brain to prevent the seizure from um, happening. I have no idea how this device would even find out when the brain is about to have a seizure. That's that's freaking out of my knowledge, which is amazing. Yeah, I think there's two of them. There's like the, the vagus nerve stimulation where I think that one's... Sorry, I had a burp. Um, there's like a little piece... In your under your skin, and it's like a wire connected to like the vagus nerve somewhere in your body, and then that sends like these small impulses. And that's supposed to prevent seizures. What they have now is something called an RNS system, where it's more like a pacemaker, where it's still a little gadget inside your body hooked up to a portion of your brain, and that's like a it's like a pacemaker. So if it shows that a seizure is about to start, it kind of shocks you. Same way if your heart goes to VTAC for a certain amount of period, the pacemaker shocks your heart. This little thing is like shocking your brain, kind of shocking you out of the seizures. And this is kind of, this one's more, more in depth, more technical because it doesn't give you these, these jolts continuously. It's like over time. So it kind of learns what your triggers are. And that's when it kind of delivers a shock to check out of that seizure. Wow. So fascinating. I wonder if there's actually natural ways to prevent seizures. I know it's not something to talk about, but you know how we covered everything from the medical side, we should have kind of dove in and talked about maybe milk thistle that works for seizures. And I have, I have no idea. And if somebody that's listening has remedies or does things for their kids, link it, let us know. I'm curious to learn. I know CBD is one of them actually, right? CBD is talk that you give your child to prevent seizures. Is it like the carnivore diet also um, to prevent seizures? Is that what it's for? When you do a high protein, low carb diet, does that kind of help with seizures as well? Keto, supposedly. So keto is really good. I used to know why and I forgot, but it works some, something with ketosis, something with um, your body burning fat. It, like, it puts a uh, protective coat around the brain, the nerve cells, something like that to prevent seizures. Yeah, I wonder how that works. I could probably look that up. Maybe we'll look it up for after hours. Okay. So... So with like seizures, um, there's usually like a pre-seizure phase. It is technically considered a like a partial seizure, but this is called also called like an aura. So people kind of feel funny, you know, they smell certain things or they hear certain things right before the seizure occurs. So they kind of know what's about to happen. So they kind of prepare themselves for uh, for what's going to happen. And it's pretty interesting how people could kind of get these random sensations right before the full-on seizure. I, I don't know much about the aura, but the deja vu feeling, huh? And we talked about postsectal, and we talked about most things of what you should be doing as a nurse. I don't know if you want to chime into anything else, but definitely big things is watch the clock. Make sure you have another nurse that's in there to give you some medication. Make sure you have a patent IV. Um, sometimes if the family's family is in the room, they're going to freak out a little bit. So you got to deescalate that situation too. It's, it's always, and that's, what's crazy about nursing. Like it's not only the patient, usually you're treating the family as well and explaining everything and all that jazz. Yeah. And these medications usually have a time frame. you know, they usually order like Q4 hours and it's very important to, you know, give the medication at appropriate time and, and don't just skip them or away now because, you know, you give it a, this med an hour and a half later hour or two hours later, it could cause them to have a seizure because you know their brain cells were depolarized or whatever the, the, the proper word is. But yeah, guys, make sure you just pad your rails. And if they have a history of seizures, you know, you make sure you're on anti-seizure medications. 
And definitely if you have like a patient that's coming in, make sure they have like the dilantin level to see if it's therapeutic. I know different med- uh, seizure medications, like they have like um, toxic screens that we should check for. Sometimes you'll load a patient up on dilantin and they're not, they're not going to get that medication for two days because their levels are way too critical and we have to watch them go down. 